But before we do that, I did notice a lot of chatter up at the top of this um, chat here about uh, Zenject. I mix that up with Zendesk all the time. Zenject and dependency injection. So I feel like we should address it. We haven't really talked too much about Zenject, I don't think. It seems like a good topic. A lot of people want to discuss it. So for those of you who don't know what Zenject is, it's a dependency injection framework designed specifically for Unity. Um, Mm -hmm. The guy who created it, Steve, I want to say his last name is Vermilion, Steve Vermilion. He's a really cool guy. I actually did an interview with him maybe over a year ago on the channel. Um, He's the one who created it and how he uh, he contributes to his own project. And he's called he's he's named it uh, Extenject. So I'll I'll put a link if this is a highlight and also in the description, I will put a link to this. Um, But basically, it's a great framework for dependency injection in Unity. Now, uh, there is some discussion about whether or not you should do or use a dependency injection framework. Um, And I think that's a lot about what people were talking about up here. I think one of the questions Mm -hmm. was why, why? Because we have said in the past, Jason, that we typically would not use something um, as heavy, I guess you could say, as Zenject. Um, And so the question is why, why don't don't we use it? Mm. Do you want to go first on this one? Sure. Uh, So when I first learned about Zenject, it really felt like, you know, when you learn about design patterns for the first time and you're like, oh, I've learned uh, the singleton pattern. Where can I use this? <laughs> yeah. MVC, where, where can I use this? Same thing with Zenject and dependency injection, which is a, which is a pattern. Uh, dep- I think it's dependency inversion uh, or inversion of control is the pattern. I'm not sure which one. Oh, yeah. So let me, let me give a cut in on this one. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. So basically you are... Um, Inversion of control is a design architectural decision, deciding. So when when you've got a A depends on B, there is an, an arrow that draws that line between A to B. And that is your dependency, is the direction of dependency. And it's hard to describe unless you've worked in, in um, dynamic linked library type stuff where you're distributing things separately. But it basically boils down to, if I change this thing, will this thing have to change to make up for the changes to the other one? And if you have A depends on B, if B changes, A has to recompile, but B is fine because B is standalone. If A recompiles and changes, B is fine because B doesn't depend on A. And so you can kind of draw your application as a series of lines just to show you which way the dependencies are, are kind of in your application. So inversion of control is actively deciding rather than having A depend on B, we'll create some interface. A will depend on the interface. B will implement the interface. Now, dependency is different. Now, only if um, the interface slash A changes and B changes. So that's fundamentally swapping. So it comes down to the low level thing is no longer dependent on the higher level thing as opposed to the other way around. A good example of this is if you had a character, you injected some behavior into it, or for every new character, you can reuse the same behavior, but it doesn't work if there was a behavior inside of it. It's hard to, we'll probably do a code example of this. It's much cleaner to explain it as an actual thing. Yeah. But that the TLDR of all of this <laughs> is inversion of control is the principle behind what you're doing. And you can use inversion of control just by taking dependencies out and putting them into a constructor or using a strategy pattern or something. It's when you take out a thing inside of it and then inject it in in some fashion. That's sort of the way you do it. As for DI, which is a term you've heard repre- representing dependency injection, mm-hmm. that is a way in which you um, fulfill those requirements for inversion of control. Yeah. Inversion of control lets you separate out and change the direction of the dependencies. And then dependency injection is where you inject dependencies into your system. The difference being, if you don't use dependency injection, you have to say new thing, which has a new thing in it, which has another new thing in it, which is another new thing. And you're manually building that tree of what represents each dependency into each other. Mm. If you use a dependency injection framework, you say, these are all the dependencies and figure it out. If this needs a this, fill it in. If that needs a that, fill that in. And you just sort of let the dependency injection root compose your application for you. So that's the difference. Uh, Inversion of control is the principle. Dependency injection frameworks are the things that actually do it to save you the automated process. If you design in an IOC manner, you can always apply DI to it. Yeah. So, I mean, a a good example of of EOS, of IOC um, is serialized fields. You are injecting those dependencies by using the unity editor. Um, I mean, is that, 
it's pretty much one way to do it. There's plenty of other ways to do it. I have a video on it. Should also probably link that in this in this description. But uh, so basically, getting back to what I was saying, thank you for the description. Um, I learned that all of that. And I was like, oh my gosh, I want to use this everywhere. And instead of thinking, well, I want to learn about inversion. Of, I want to use inversion of control to make my life easier. It just became a matter of well, how can I use Zenject to everywhere? And, you know, Zenject is great because you really can uh, you really can get a lot of control over your dependencies. Um, and it really is a nice standardized way to handle dependency injection. And theoretically, if enough people know about Zenject, then it does ease in the process of bringing someone else onto a project because you can say, oh, do you know about Zenject? You do. I'm using Zenject. And right there, they know exactly how you are passing around your dependencies. That being said, for simple projects to medium-sized projects, I would argue that you're probably better off just handling your own dependencies because Zenject does hand, uh, add a lot of extra features that oftentimes can bog you down. And then another thing with that is that because uh, Zenject relies on attributes like the inject attribute um, and some of its features like pooling, which aren't necessarily related to inversion control, but uh, it somehow works itself in, um, those features really can couple themselves to your code in a way that eventually you get to a point where you couldn't even remove Zenject if you wanted to. Um, and that and is lock in. Yeah, it can be a you, problem. That that becomes a problem. So generally speaking, unless it's a really big project and I really need some tight control over my dependency injection because I just can't handle it, um, that's where I'd use Zenject. But otherwise, I generally prefer nowadays to just try to manage it myself. Yeah. So I, I think pretty much exactly what you said. The the, the kind of summary version for me would be uh, we discussed before you ain't gonna need it and. Uh, dependency mm. injection is designed um, as a way of automatically fulfilling large trees of dependency kind of requirement. So if you've got an A which requires a B and a C which requires an A which requires a C and all of a sudden you're getting to this sort of nested cascading concept, uh, that is a very good case for dependency injection framework. If you can manage it by building a couple of builders and factories, you can probably get away without it. Uh, it may seem like we're trying to avoid adding it, but a better way I'd phrase it is, like I said, you can you can design your code in an inverted inversion of control method that will allow you to test and do your code and build your components yourself and everything works fine. And you can always add uh, dependency injection whenever it gets to the point where managing the, the, the injecting yourself starts to become too big of a project to handle. Mm. And I've found uh, more often than not, it just it doesn't get that far. Now, if you're building a giant game, sure, but it is worth noting that a dependency injection framework is usually the root of your application. It is literally yeah. the thing that composes, builds, and runs your app. A good example of this is if you use .NET Core, where you're building a web API, um, or hell, if you're using something like um, Angular and you're building some sort of uh, enter enter uh, Express uh, Express JS, you know, web. API, you know, building on a node build or something. It doesn't matter what you're doing. A lot of these systems tend to have a backend that basically is some form of inversion of control. Mm. It is building your dependencies, composing and injecting them. And that's that tends to be the route that your application is built on. So in an API sense, you are composing all of your dependencies in one place, build your controllers, you use them. But the thing is, Unity has an engine. Well, Unity <laughs> it is an engine, right? The whole point of Unity as, as we have it is it's using a component model. And a component model is a way to handle dependencies. It is literally composing things as a suite of components, stacking their, their usages and using them as a tree structure. So not the dependency uh, injection is wrong. It's just that if your application is so complicated that you're using dependency injection for it in a game context, you might you could have probably gotten there by using the systems Unity provides for you. I'm not saying Unity has everything built in, mm. but it is designed to build scalable large games kinds of problems where dependency injection is fit for is usually an application that doesn't have all of that stuff and, and all of that architecture in place for you. So I have used it. Mostly I've used it in things which are very service oriented. If you've got an application where the, you're sending data to multiple sources, you're building for multiple platforms, you've got multiple um, providers of data, or you're connecting to multiple APIs, then you might want to build configuration sets 
right? So this is the configuration to load for Android. This is the configuration to load for, um, you know, devices on PC or whatever else. There might be a case for it. But even then, I find I would rather spend a minute or two writing in a new dependency into a config file than I would adding an entire library just for the sake of doing it. And then, yeah. as Charles said, you're putting inject headers in all of your scripts. And if someone says, hey, can you pass me on that script you have in your project? Uh, and you give it to them, and they go, oh, I can't use this. I need to have a framework installed. You're like, okay, well, remove the thing, make it public, give yourself constructor. Pass. Like All of a sudden, they have to rewrite all of your script just to handle that support. So I would only use it if um, the application has grown to the point where I can now add it, and it will start saving me time. Isn't much of an issue. Most of the time, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, I think if you're going to use a dependency injection framework, um, Extendject is definitely the way to go. It's really well written. It's been optimized. Um, again, Steve Vermillion, the guy who created it, uh, he's a very smart guy, and I have total faith in his in that asset. But yeah, it's just one of those things that you don't want to put the cart before the horse, like I did, because I was trying to find every need. Uh, I was trying to shoehorn it into every project I ever used. Um, and that's just, you know, one of those things where I'm speaking from experience as you mature as a developer, you you try to just make do and write what you need. And and Yagni seems to be a theme of this stream so far. I've said it a couple we've said it a couple times. Yeah, it kind of has been right. Yeah, right. Yagni title that the stream. Um if you if you don't need it, you know, don't put it in. And if that means the first the first time you need to inject some sort of dependency or you feel the need to do that is not the time to say, all right, let's install and inject. It's That's the time not you're the sitting time. there and going, oh my God, 20% of my work time is spent building components and doing stuff. It's the same for tooling, right? That's the time. When something, when something starts becoming more work to manage and configure than it is to write, that's when you might start asking yourself, is there value in, in doing it? I will say though, if you get to that stage, uh, Zenjek is a good solution because if you ever tried to write your own dependency injection framework, you can actually do it in probably 200 lines. It's not that complicated to write a yeah. very, very basic one. There's a great you article that you could follow through and yeah, you can write your own one pretty easily. <laughs> but what you'll start to figure out is because it uses the activator and it basically um, it does an awful lot of interesting stuff with casting and figuring out what types are necessary and managing scopes, you can write one that'll work but it won't work the way you expect it to. So a lot of very clever work has been done to get these dependency injections to work the way they do. So if you do need one, you know, go to the people who've been doing a lot and, yeah. and making them work very well. It's just ask yourself if you've gotten to the stage where you actually need it, you know? Yeah. So I think uh, Black Panda Studios summed it up, and then we can move on to the code review. And he says, basically, every pattern has its pros and cons, and none of them are the solution to all problems. So remember, if you're holding it. a hammer, not everything is a nail, even if it looks like it, you know? Yeah. yeah. And I would say don't even don't even go to the toolbox until you really have figured out that, yeah, you can't pull that nail out with your hands or, you you know, whatever the analogy is. You know? <laughs> Just try to do it. And then if you can't do it or if it gets too complicated or, or busy, uh, yeah, try to find a tool or a design pattern. I know that's easier said than done. I think we should point that out. It's It's, you know, design patterns are... I guess, sorry for the, I, I can't find, I can't think of a better term. They're abused because mm -hmm. they are, they provide so much hope and they are so simple. You know, they really do uh, encapsulate these problems that we come up against. And, and you look at them and you say, wow, a design pattern. This, this is, uh, this sounds like exactly the problem I was having, you know, but, but, you know, you really can't overuse them. Uh, if you think that way, sure, it's good to know them all, but, you know, you should try to take care of it yourself. And if you need it, apply the design pattern where needed. You know, it's rough. It's, it's a hard one.